All right, are you all able to see my screen now? Yes. Great, okay, thanks so much. Um, so as he said, my name is Beth Quinn. I'm a physical therapist. I'm a board certified geriatric clinical specialist. Um, so this population is certainly a passion of mine. I'm a faculty member um, with the physical therapy program at Bellarmine University in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I've worked in a variety of settings prior to um, my teaching role um, and help supervise one of our service learning clinics um, that our students lead. That's a balance and falls prevention program here in Louisville. I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but my primary objectives for today, first we wanna just talk about the role of outcome measures in detecting fall risk attributes. Um, it is it is impossible to predict with absolute certainty who is going to fall and who is not. Um, but we all certainly want to identify those at highest risk so we can provide the proper interventions, assistance, and support for those individuals. Um, and today I'm going to demonstrate one option for the use of movement analysis technology for data collection. Um, there are some fantastic tools out there um, that are coming to market. And so I just wanted to demonstrate one of those tools that our program uses, some of our students use with our Balance and Falls Prevention Program. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk just a little bit about the value of this data, especially tracking and trending that data over time. Um, so again, we can be keenly aware of change in our older adults. Um, because sometimes those changes can happen um, subtly. So how can we best identify that? Um, at any point, if you guys have questions, um, again, feel free to put it in the chat box or um, unmute yourself, holler at me, whatever you need to do. But I'm super excited to be here and share this information with you today. Um, I'm not going to go into depth on the number of falls and, and how many happens. We all, I think this group is keenly aware of the impact of falls on our older adults. Um, I do want to revisit um, from a PT perspective, from a healthcare perspective, some of the changes that we do typically see with aging, um, because those changes or knowing those changes can help influence what attributes we're monitoring with our older adults. So some of the changes that we do typically see with our older adults, we see a reduced flexibility um, in lower extremity joints, decreased strength of the ankle, knees, and hips, which we all know are super important in, our, um, in managing our balance. Um, older adults tend to have less control of momentum, <clears throat> decreased coordination, decreased uh, reflexes, um, and increased reaction time. So being able to respond to environmental changes as quick can be, be decreased. Um, we will also see vision and sensory changes. And then when we look at their mobility, um, we do see that our um, walking speed slows down with older adults. We see shorter step length and wider base of support. So those are all attributes that are typical um, with the normal progress, uh, progression of aging. Uh, now the rate of these changes vary from person to person. They can be accelerated in the presence of certain diseases and physical in inactivity. Um, in a few slides, I'm gonna introduce you to my mom who was willing to be video recorded with this. Um, she is currently recovering from ovarian cancer and uh, about six rounds of chemotherapy. Um, so with that, she started to develop some neuropathy. So some of those sensory changes that we might expect um, have certainly been accelerated in her case due to her um, cancer diagnosis and subsequent medical treatment. With that being said, we also know that many of these changes can be mitigated or um, slowed down with targeted exercises, physical activity, and appropriate medical care. So Knowing these changes can certainly help us target outcome measures and what we wanna be looking for with our older adults. Um, in preparation for this, I pulled a couple of um, recent articles that help us determine what outcome measures um, or what tools are gonna to be most sensitive in helping um, identify those older adults at risk of falling. 
Um, you know, these systematic reviews aim to evaluate the predictive of the uh, um, predictive ability of various falls assessment tools. Um, the first article looks at history questions, self-reported measures, um, and performance-based measures used in assessing fall risk of community dwelling older adults. Um, the researchers calculated and compared post-test probability values for individual tests and measures. So again, what measures help identify those patients who may end up falling, um, following the outcome measures? Second and third articles have similar goals in identifying the most practical assessment tool for primary care measures. Sounds like a lot of our audience um, are community-based um, agencies, um, really working at the community-based level. So what are those tools that are also practical um, and easily accessible for mobility screening um, for clinicians and even um, lay persons that might be helping with these programs? So these are just what we pulled. Um, when you look at these articles, there's often an overlap of uh, recommended outcome measures, okay? The ones I'm gonna be talking about with our technology movement analysis system are the performance-based functional measures. But I also just want to keep in the conversation some of the self-reported measures and screening questions. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure I included those, those pieces on this slide. But when we look to the literature to say which outcome tools are gonna to give us some predictive ability to identify false risk, we often come across measures like the Berg, Berg balance scale, timed up and go, single leg stance, five times sit to stand, self-selected walking speed, the POMA or the performance oriented mobility assessment and Tonetti scale, functional reach and four square test. Some of you guys may be familiar with some of these outcome measures. Some of you may have never heard of them before, um, but I'm going to demonstrate in a video here in a little bit, some of these um, outcome measures that have been known to um, be predictor, um, good predictors in falls risk. So just to give a little context to you of my um, experience with different technology, um, as part of our physical therapy program at Bellarmine, we have a um, service learning and community engagement curriculum that courses over four semesters of our program where students are engaged in pro bono care, either on campus or um, in partnership with community agencies here in the Louisville area to provide physical therapy care. Um, we see it as a win-win opportunity. Our students are able to practice and be supervised early in the didactic curriculum um, of the program, supervised by licensed PTs, while giving um, some community service, um, especially to some populations that are at high need. We have, for example, a pediatric clinic here on campus that is a great adjunct to families that may have exhausted um, insurance covered care for their little ones. We have a traditional sports and orthopedic clinic here on campus, um, as well as a Parkinson's dance class um, that, that one of our faculty members have hosted for quite a while. One of our off-campus service learning clinics is a program um, in partnership with the Thrive Center, which is a nonprofit here in Louisville, who is a, um, their mission is to integrate technology, um, healthcare providers, research, and community dwelling older adults to really optimize aging. Um, Sherry Rose is the CEO at the Thrive Center and has been generous enough to allow our students to come to her facility twice a week um, for almost five years to help host a balance and falls prevention class. Um, there, she's able to highlight and display a lot of emerging technology in the aging healthcare sector. Um, earlier, you guys were talking about the OB. Um, well, Sherry has an OB there at the Thrive Center. Um, it's a fantastic tool. It's a very engaging, fun device um, that we've been able to incorporate into our older adult uh, care. Um, they are playing. They feel like they're playing a game on a table or on the floor. They're playing soccer. Or they're um, painting pictures. It's, but it's really fun to be able to integrate that technology into our service learning um, clinic. 
One of the devices though, the one that I'm gonna highlight today is called the VTS Balance System. Um, it's um, produced by a company called VirtuSense. I will give a, discla a, a disclaimer, I have nothing to disclose. I have no financial interest in VirtuSense. I'm not paid by them. Um, be nice, but I'm not. Um, but it is a, a product that we've used for several years um, and it has really been able to enhance our assessment and intervention with our older, older adults and our falls prevention class. Um, so the VTS balance system uses motion capture technology. Um, it video records movement um, and movement performed during some of the outcome measures that I mentioned on the previous slide. This photo that you see here on the slide, I clipped from their website. In it, um, and I don't know if my cursor is showing up, you can see there the video camera is mounted here on the stand. Um, there's a, a keyboard and a laptop and then a screen or monitor that um, shows the data that's being collected. Our tool here on campus is not mounted on this fancy portable device. We just have the camera, we have a laptop it hooks up to, and it can be packed up in a backpack and um, carried around wherever we might need it. So it is a very portable device, um, unlike some traditional um, movement analysis systems that often were very large, clunky pieces of, of technology. It's a highly portable device. Um, and what it does, it uses that video capture technology, records the movement, and uses their AI data analysis to detect um, factors contributing to overall falls risk and really give the clinician super objective data, measurable data on how that movement looks like. Um, the system also provides a really patient-friendly report um, because knowledge is power, right? So if we can collect this data on the performance measures, provide that education to patients, it can be very a very powerful tool in letting them know how their current function is performing in relation to age reference norms, um, or just compared to their own previous performance over time. Um, so that's the device. What I did, um, I had my mother, who is 77 years old, uh, community dwelling, older adult. Um, I had her go through four of the outcome measures that we often use um, with the VirtuSense and recorded it so you can see the device in action. Um, so I have a short video clip of the assessment tool and then we'll look at the results. Everything okay so far? All right, I'm gonna hit play. If the audio works, great. If not, once the clip is done, let me know and I'll narrate for us. Terry, when I say go, you're gonna stand up, walk to the blue line, can you turn up the volume just a little bit? It's a little low, if, if, if it's possible. Maybe. I think I tried to turn it up a little bit there. There, there wasn't a whole lot of audio. So that was oh, okay. my mother. Um, that was her timed up and go. And if you guys are familiar with this outcome measure, it is a look at um, initiation of movement, dynamic stability, and balance. The participant or subject is instructed to, um, on the, the verbal command of go, stand up, walk three meters, turn around, walk back to the chair and sit down. Um, this is a very um, frequently used tool. You'll see it a lot in balance and falls prevention research. The, depending on which, um, oops, depending on which research data point you use, um, the cutoff score typically ranges around 12 seconds for falls risk or not. Um, and as you can see, the, computer, so the computer screen's on the bottom, and then I tried to get a clip of her on the shared screen with her on the top. It analyzes her movement, it times it, and, um, and records that data 
throughout the time that the participant takes to move. Um, oops, sorry, I'm gonna go to this next screen. So you saw the, the test run. Traditionally in a clinic, one nice thing about the timed up and go or the tug score is that you don't need a lot of equipment. You need a chair, a stopwatch, and a um, short space for the, for the participant to be able to walk and move. Usually the data point that a clinician has is the time in seconds that it took them. And that, that amount of time is really the, the biggest piece of information. However, the virtue sense or the, the VTS balance system is able to give me as a clinician a lot more detailed objective information about that patient's or subject's ability to walk that distance. It gives me step length, stride length, cadence, um, and a lot of attributes about their gait cycle, which may be helpful because if I as a clinician recognizes that someone has a slow tug score and I have someone with a history of a stroke or a joint replacement or something that might be impacting their gait cycle, I have a lot more information at my fingertips to influence my intervention choices as I go through. As I mentioned earlier too, the, the VTS balance system, as you can see here on the top, will interpret the score. So it took her 12.6 seconds to complete the tug. Um, if we use just the traditional cutoff marker of 12 seconds, it does show that she is at an increased risk of falling. Giving an age referenced norm, I had plugged in her date of birth into the system and it compares her mobility to um, other partic or previous participants or subjects of her age category. So with her performance, she is in that yellow category, medium mobility or an increased risk of falling, okay? So that's the tug. Um, it can be used with an assistive device. For those of you clinicians who might have that question, if someone had a cane or a walker, they can continue to use that assistive device when they use the BTS balance system um, to record that tug. All right, this next one I'm gonna demonstrate here is the five times sit to stand. Um, and I'm gonna play the full video clip. I'm gonna try and increase my volume as much as possible. Um, it is a little bit longer video clip because I actually had a, a little tech glitch at the beginning, but I, I want anyone who's using technology or incorporating new tech into their um, patient care to understand that sometimes you have to learn how to use the system. So I had to calibrate the system at first so it knows what her sitting and standing positions are. So we had a little bit of a false start. So really, I just made her do an extra sit stand. It was great. All right, so that was the five times sit to stand uh, with a little bit of a tech glitch as well. Um, so it records again in time, how long it, um, it takes to perform it. She was a total of 14 seconds. 
Um, one thing that I love about the VTS balance systems um, ability to do this, as a clinician, I typically have just the total time in seconds, but here it's given me a breakdown of the time required to perform each rep. So maybe someone has the leg strength to perform a great sit to stand for one or two repetitions, but over time they fatigue quickly gives me a much different picture. If I see this time increasing, they're able to do the first one in maybe two or three seconds, maybe three or four seconds. And then if it starts taking me much longer with rep three or four, it can be telling as to their endurance and motor fatigue um, over time. All right, I'm gonna show the other two outcome measures. This one is called the functional reach um, and it, basically measures an individual's ability to reach outside of their base of support without having to take a step, without losing their balance. All right, and then it will do it. Um, you can do then a lateral reach left and right following that. Um, for the maybe the PTs that are on here that had a heart attack because I'm not standing there guarding my mom. Normally I would be right next to my patient guarding them with a gate belt. Um, I was flying solo and we had practiced this a couple of times. So I knew her, her capability. So here is the measurement on the functional reach. It is measured in inches um, and the cutoff is usually nine or 10 inches depending on which reference you're using. She actually scored in the green here, high mobility, um, which I was very proud of her for. This is one tool, again, that having a very specific um, measurement uh, is much more accurate than anything I can do as a clinician. We often eyeball measurements like, okay, I think she was about nine inches, or I think she was, looks like about 10 inches using a tape measure against a wall or a sheet of paper. Um, but this system is able to give us a much more accurate measurement um, with, the pay, with the subject's ability to reach outside of their base of support. So those are all outcome measures super short to administer, as you can tell, most of them take under a minute, um, depending on their ability to follow instructions or any practice trials that they might need. The last one I'm gonna demonstrate um, that wasn't mentioned on my previous slides, but it's a, it's a measurement that the BTS balance um, is able to give some fascinating data to clinicians. And this is the modified CATSIB. Um, or the clinical test of sensory interaction and balance. And it's essentially looking at an individual's ability to maintain their static balance and how they incorporate their different sensory systems. So how do they utilize their vision, their vestibular system and their somatosensory or their sensation uh, in their feet to maintain upright and maintain their balance. Um, and so typically we would have an individual go through four different states, maintaining their static balance for 30 seconds. The four different states are eyes open on firm surface, eyes closed on firm surface. Then we repeat those two eyes open as eyes and eyes closed when they're standing on a piece of foam. And that lets us have a better understanding of how their different sensory systems are allowing them to maintain their position in space, okay? Um, I have a short video clip of the first two states that I'll play now. So on the right is the video of her um, that, that the device is capturing. On the left is a tracing of her center of gravity. Again, as a clinician, 
um, without this device, I'm normally eyeballing. Were they able to maintain their balance good, fair, or poor? But here I'm able to get a discrete measurement of their sway and lateral displacement. We're gonna repeat that 30 seconds with eyes closed. As we start to take away different sensory input, whether it's a firm surface or their vision, you can see how their ability to maintain static stance um, starts to deteriorate or starts to decline. Um, and it can really help us identify individuals that need targeted intervention um, for these sensory systems. I, I did repeat the other two states um, where she was eyes open on foam and eyes closed on foam, but I did stand next to her for those two pieces. Um, you are able to operate this device with a remote. So as a clinician, I can keep my hands on my patient and still control the device. Um, but because of her evolving neuropathy, she was not as steady with these two. So here is the printout from her results on the modified cat sib. Comparing to traditional administration of this tool, I would have scored as a, as a clinician, good, fair, or poor, how their performance was in each of these measurements. Instead, with the VTS balance system, I'm able to get discrete data points that measure the amount of sway and shift that each individual had, as well as the time in seconds they were able to maintain that position. I don't always have um, participants that can tolerate standing still for the full 30 seconds, um, especially in eyes closed or on the foam surface. Overall, she scored again in the green category. She actually did fairly well with this outcome measure. Um, the VTS system uses a proprietary algorithm to calculate the score based on their age and their performance. So her composite score was an 88%. What the system also does then is analyzes the different states and tells me how strong each of her sensory systems performed in helping her maintain her balance. So her visual system, she scored a 90. So when she was able to use her vision to give her that sensory input and maintain her position in space, she scored a 90. Her somatosensory actually scored the highest at a 99%. And then, which is, and this is not uncommon with her older adults, her vestibular, sorry, vestibular system was probably her weakest system here, scoring a 73% indicating that her inner ear apparatus or her vestibular system is not contributing as strongly to her, um, her ability to main, maintain static positions. This also gives us a breakdown of her scores in each of the four states that I had her perform, as well as given the amount of sway and shift that she had. The last tracing that it shows, as you could see from the video, it is tracing out which direction they may be shifting or swaying. So this is her tracing from each of her different uh, positions. As you can see, the eyes closed on foam was her um, uh, weakest category. It's where she swayed and struggled the most. Um, and this is important, gives us important information as clinicians on how we might need to um, provide a treatment plan for our older adults. All right, so just talking about um, how we've utilized this in our um, service learning clinic and how it can help us as therapists provide um, improved data. I always um, remind our students whenever we look at new pieces of technology and there's sometimes that whole like, oh, is this gonna replace me as a PT? Um, this is simply a tool that is providing us accurate and objective measurements um, to standardize outcome measures that are already in existence. These are already validated and researched tools that we're often very familiar with, 
but this allows us to have an enhanced um, assessment of that performance, which then contributes to the therapist's clinical decision. Um, so it's by no means replacing um, therapists, but it's really providing more accuracy than visual assessment alone. Um, another nice piece of this, and as we're starting to see technology continue to uh, evolve and, and refine, it's a very portable device. So if we are thinking about using these in community screening events or using in a patient's home, I'm not lugging in this really hefty movement analysis device with lots of cameras and biomarkers or body markers. It is a um, wire, you know, wireless device that can be easily transported for ease of use. Um, and then the final piece that I, I wanna maybe advocate for use of any type of technology is tracking their performance over time. So, um, and I did not unfortunately have time to screen screenshot this piece, but on um, our device that we have set up at the Thrive Center, um, I have some participants that have been coming to our Balance and Falls Prevention class for three to four years now at this point. They're, they've come religiously, they're engaged, they're very invested in their, um, in their safety and ability to maintain their independence and live, live uh, independently in their homes. Um, and this program that we have has allowed them to have that social activity, therapeutic intervention, and monitoring over time. So one of my participants who's been coming for about, probably about four years, I have four years of timed up and go data on her that has allowed us to see how she's either improving um, over the course of a semester with class, or maybe how she's regressed over the summer when she wasn't doing the two times a week class. And we noticed um, it's not a part of a formal study or anything like that. It was really just an observation when we were doing her data collection this past spring that we saw this trend in the fall at the beginning of the semester when she had kind of been off of class, she typically had the slowest timed up and go scores. And then we would usually reassess at the end of the semester, kind of a pre-test, post-test outcome measure and she would improve over time and then usually maintain those gains over the spring semester and then sometimes have a little dip back up to a longer tab time over the summer um and what you know one of my passions for older adults is how can we identify that change over time as early as possible you know we may have individuals who maybe are slowly losing some of their strength or speed um, or agility, but until it hits that critical functional threshold, we often don't realize it, right? They make slow adaptations um, and are able to hide some of those declines until all of a sudden they can't stand up from their chair one day, or it just takes one minor illness to really knock them below that critical threshold. So um, whether it's a device like the BTS balance or other emerging forms of technology, um, we really want to help all healthcare providers and community advocates to embrace whatever forms of technology are out there to improve the assessment, screening, and monitoring of our older adults in the, in the community. Um, I, that's really most of my presentation. I'm happy to at, answer any questions either about the device, about our Balance and Falls Prevention Program, or about potential utility of these devices. So thank you very much. I love that we have so many people engaged in this topic today. Okay, yes, Mia uh, said, cool technology. Any chances there is a future study on people with head injury or possible other injuries that affect balance or vestibular system or other brain regions? So, I mean, absolutely. Um, we have, um, and, and some of our students, I, I forgot to mention this, some of our students have, um, utilize the VTS balance system in some of their capstone projects. 
Now, some of the projects have focused on validating some of these outcome measures and say, hey, is this uh, piece of technology reliable and accurate compared to traditional forms of, of these outcome measures? Um, and then some of them have simply just used this as a tool to collect data in other um, research studies. So there are all sorts of um, ways to utilize this device in research, really with a, a whole range of population uh, for these individuals. Um, one area too, this is a tangent, but I didn't talk about the VTS balance system, as well as other tech devices on the market. They'll often have an assessment component, and then they often have an intervention component. So if we think about gaming and balance intervention, everyone likely is familiar with the Wii and the Wii Fit and the Wii Balance system. Um, the more we can also use these things as gaming interventions where they're engaging and fun um, can help increase the, the utilization and outcomes. So if I think about brain injury, whether it's dealing with some cognitive retraining or even attention to tasks, if it's in a gaming format, are they more likely to increase their exercise or exercise intensity or activity intensity? So, so the answer is yes. There's a lot of different options for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dana Davidson, she asked, is this program particular to Bellarmine or are there other balanced programs in the other areas of the state? So are you talking about the Strive to Thrive program or um, or the VTS balance system? And Dana, you should be able to unmute yourself if you'd like to uh, elaborate on your question a little more. Uh, she put in the question and answer, yes, both. Okay. So the our you know what we've kind of informally called our Strive to Thrive program is just something that we do here at Bellarmine. Um, we it it was a students student led project to begin with. It was one of their capstone projects where they wanted to create a twelve week balance and falls prevention class. So we have evolved that um, and had different variations of this class um, as part of our service learning curriculum. Now, I wish, and, and who knows, maybe down the road, it'll be replicated. Um, the trick is always finding um, the, the right community partners and funding. Um, so our students engage and lead this class as part of the curriculum. So it's a uh, credit bearing course for, for these students. And so we're able to provide it at no cost to the the to the, the community members because it's a pro bono clinic, um, but it's certainly something that could be replicated um, outside of that. With the VTS balance system, so we have one of the devices here at Bellarmine that we're able to, um, to have to expose students to the technology and the Thrive Center down um, downtown Louisville has one of the systems as well. I do know a lot of PT clinics or um, long-term care facilities that do have the device as well that has been incorporated into the, the rehab departments there. Um, and I didn't provide information about the company, but you could do a quick Google search for VirtuSense and inquire more about the actual device if you wanted to relate directly with the company. Again, I'm not employed or get any type of financial kickback for talking about the device. I just like talking about how we've included that technology into our student training as well as our community engagement. Okay, any other questions? I'm not seeing any. Uh, hold on just a minute. I think we got one. I see Carrie said, interesting presentation. Thanks. Do you know whether this technology or similar is what is being used to provide additional data points on in PT or OT in horse therapy or 
hippotherapy. My mother and I have special interest in use of horses to promote gait balance and improvements. Fascinating question. Um, I am not sure if any therapists that provide hippotherapy have incorporated anything like this necessarily. Um, I actually just visited with Green Hill Therapy, which is here in Louisville out on the east end of town. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had a student who was doing a clinical rotation there and they're mostly pediatric therapy, but they do use um, hippotherapy as, as part of their ther therapeutic interventions. And I'm not sure if they have done anything like that. Um, you know, when I'm thinking about different forms of technology and our, our students use, you know, our goal is to expose them to whatever's emerging on the market. Because sure enough, by the time they graduate, there's going to be a new version, a new device out there. So sometimes it's just conceptually what's the right thing to do with that. I could see um, really almost looking at maybe some wearables or pressure sensor um, technology being great for use with hippotherapy. Um, when we're looking again at center of gravity um, or how maybe someone weight shifts within the saddle might being, uh, might being some beneficial data points to collect. Um, I do know with hippotherapy, really with any type of therapeutic intervention, we wanna see, you know, how is someone performing and responding to that, that intervention? But then we also wanna look at what are, what's the carryover into other functional tasks, right? So if you're thinking about hippotherapy or riding a horse to improve core strength and reactionary balance um, and trunk trunk control. It's great if we can see that improvement while they're on the horse, but how does that also carry over into someone's ability to do ADLs in the home? Um, how does it you know, translate to their ability to get in and out of the bathtub or in and out of a car to those functional tasks too? So I think there's some, some options that you could certainly use in tracking um, the benefits uh, with the VTS balance system. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dana made a comment. Thank you. The Strive to Thrive is a great program. I would like to see it replicated. I am in Lexington and thought UK might have a similar program. I am not sure. I do know the UK PT program has a longstanding pro bono clinic. Um, and I'm not, but I'm not for sure what options they have with that. Um, I, you know, again, I'll, I'll put in a personal plug for community-based programs. Um, and I think, um, some were mentioned earlier that are wonderful programs. Walk with ease, Tai Chi, the bingo size is fantastic, right? And I, I love that agencies are thinking about the different formats of these programs um, COVID taught us that there often needs to be some hybrid or remote access to these classes. You know, I think about my mom, my mom does not drive anymore. Um, and I would love to get her to more community-based programs, but transportation is often a problem. So if there are ways to increase that accessibility through, um, telehealth or zooming participants in, that's great. Um, however, there's also something to be said about social isolation and loneliness. And one of the things that we have just long noticed and observed, any of you all who do community-based programs know that that socialization, that community that's formed with these classes is just incredibly valuable as well. So what, you know, and I can certainly give, give you all more information about our particular program and what activities we engage with, um, with our Strive to Thrive program. Um, but any opportunities you all have to support those community-based resources, please, you know, continue to do because it, it's fantastic. As a PT, we'll often see individuals who make gains with therapy. Insurance only pays for it for so long, right? Or they meet their goals, which is great, but how do they maintain that? Um, and that's when being able to have those resources in the community to refer um, uh, individuals to is just incredibly valuable. Okay. 
Uh, Carolyn Wallace asks, I'm wondering where one can procure a Wii or a comparable Wii balance technology for gaming. Uh, do they even still make those? That's, I was about to say that. I'm like, I'm not sure they even still make the Wiis. Um, you know, the uh, Xbox Connect was a, a program that they had for quite a while as well. Um, but with that being said, I do know there's a lot of devices on the market that um, whether it's a virtual reality headset um, that has some of those gaming opportunities um, at the Thrive Center, we have a couple of those devices. There's one called Neuro Rehab. There's one called Upright VR, um, and they are certainly designed for inter like more of a medical intervention, therapeutic intervention piece. But you can also go out and get uh, VR headsets or other gaming devices that are just purely fun and games that can be, you know, multi-purposed for that. They may not collect the data um, from an outcome measure standpoint quite that way. So um, I do know the every year the, at the APTA's national conference, they'll often have a, a Technopalooza where they do feature and highlight a lot of the new devices um, out there. So, so some of it's just a matter of finding, finding where those devices are. I don't know if we fits are even made anymore though, or if they are even supported from a, from a, um, yeah. Oh yeah. The we fit was fantastic. And with the we fit board, you, you did, you got that visual feedback for participants. Um, like I remember one of them was, or you have like the skiing where you have to lean and weight shift from side to side from a PT's perspective, that's weight shifting and pre-date activities for the participant. It's just skiing. It's just trying to make sure you go through the, the, the poles and not, not run the flags down. Um, so anytime you can do to, to make it engaging and fun is, is great. One of my students, I had a group that did a capstone project last year that looked at balance exercise intensity, right? I can have someone do some traditional balance exercises, single leg stance, reaching for cones, different activities like that. Um, and we try and make it as fun and, and engaging as possible. But then we replicated some of those balance tasks with the virtue sense. They have some games like veggie slicer where you're having to slice veggies with your hands or the skiing piece and looking to see do they actually exercise harder when they're distracted and they're having fun versus just doing therapy? Um, and we had, it was a really small study size, but we definitely had some, some promising results. So, um, so it's just some things to, to think about. Maybe a Shark Tank project. <laughs> there you go. My husband would love that. <laughs> And Any just, other questions, either about the technology or things that our students are doing? Um, I, I will say I have the the joy and the the um, I don't know, just the pleasure of getting to do some of this through our service learning clinics, where we're not having to necessarily directly worry about funding or insurance visits or things like that. But it allows us to dream and see the benefits, um, and hopefully then realize what might be passed off to some of our community partners and community agencies um, as to uh, effective and engaging activities for our community older adults. Uh, just to make sure that you saw the comment from Carrie, she said, thanks, Beth. I'll reach out to you for further resource sharing. So just want to make Crazy. sure you saw that. Uh, then Dana said, great job, and your mother is lucky to have you as her daughter. Mm. Well, anyone that has a health care provider as a, a family member, she uh, that was more physical activity than she often does, but it was, uh, it was, it was good. It was a, a beneficial for her, and she's just waiting for her Academy Award nomination uh, for her video debut. It was great. Any well, other, thank you. Any I was other questions? Say, Go ahead. I'm I was sorry. Say, please, please feel free to reach out if you guys have any other questions. Um, I think Julie Hartman is a, a part of the organization. She's one of my colleagues here at Bellarmine. 
and um, can also get in touch and, and is also a great resource herself um, in, in working in this realm. So thank you guys so much and kudos to all the good work that you all are doing.